hey, we are so glad that you made the decision to join us for our collective online experience. It means the world to us that you would choose to spend a part of your week with us, and we hope you enjoy today's message. Lord, um, we thank you for today. God, I just, um, we sang these songs about Thanksgiving, and the fact is, is that we can come and we can worship the one and true God freely without worrying about persecution, without worrying about anything, Lord Jesus, that we can simply have the freedom to enter your courts with thanksgiving and praise as a community. And because you've given us that ability to do so, God, we're not going to take this for granted, and we want to take this time this morning to bind our faith together. Lord, to pray for the Middle East. It's so cliche, but there needs to be peace in the Middle East. God, it is so hard to sometimes understand why there's tension down there, why there's war, things going back historically. Things are constantly changing from one side to the next. But I know this, ultimately you love your creation and you love humanity, Lord Jesus. And your heart is not that people should perish, but that people would come to the understanding and the love of Jesus to be with you, Father. And so right now, We pray for peace, Lord Jesus. We pray for peace on both sides. Just as we can't always understand what goes on down there, we don't even understand how your peace even works, as Scripture declares, Lord. But So we pray for that very peace to come about right now in the name of Jesus. We pray against any war. We pray against, Father, any hatred right now in the name of Jesus. We pray protection over your people, over your children, Lord Jesus. Father, we pray that the tension would be dismantled. To Lord Jesus, that resolution would come about, Lord, that you would give your angels charge over those nations right now in the name of Jesus, and that you would move as you do so miraculously, Lord. And Father, we look to you in this time of distress, Lord, and we pray for those, Jesus, who do not know you in this time, that they would call on the name that is above all names, and that is the name of Jesus. And so, Lord, we thank you this morning. Lord, we bind our faith together once again. We touch agreement on this thing, and we ask you to move and to not delay. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, amen. Come on, can we give the Lord a shout of praise this morning? Hey, before you're seated, would you do me a favor? Turn to your neighbor and give them a high five. Tell them how great they look today. Even if you have to lie to them, that is okay. We are happy that they're here. Hey, Collective Church, I want to welcome you once again. It's so good to see you guys. It's so good to see you here this morning at first service at the Collective Service or the Collective Church. Hey, if you're visiting with us, man, it just it means the world to us that you're here. We know that you could have been anywhere, like at the fair. Haha, <laughs> they shut it down. Thank God, but you're here. <laughs> and that means the world to us. We're so happy that you're here and we'd love to connect with you. So do us a favor, stop by our welcome center. Can we give one more time our guests a round of applause? They are here. Hey, also just a couple of quick things. We launched connect groups a couple of weeks ago. How many of you are in a connect group here at the Collective Church? Are you in a connect group? All right, eight of us. This is awesome. Life in community. And so we launched 22 connect groups at the Collective Church, which is awesome for a church that is new and a church that is our size. Hey, we believe that life is to be done in community. We're never to do life alone, so don't. You don't have to. How do I get plugged in at a new church? If I'm new to a church, how do I get connected? Connect groups are an incredible way for you to meet other people. And if you want to know how to do so, go on our website. We have all our connect groups listed on there. You can uh, shop for a connect group. There's a sale right now, 10% off. No, but you can go 20% off if you want to go to Matt's group. That's awesome. And so, but check that out. And also, I know Jennifer Payne did such an incredible job talking about pizza with, yes, thank you, Jennifer Payne. Pizza with the pastor is next Sunday. If you are looking to take your next step at the collective, this doesn't mean you're a member. It doesn't mean you have to serve. It doesn't mean you have to do anything except come and eat pizza. Look, Ashley and I would love to see you there. It's an opportunity for us to get to know you and you to get to know us. And um, we'd love to just meet you. So come and check that out. It's after second service. It's only four hours long, and that's just it. It's about 45 minutes long. We also have child care, and we also feed your children as well. So we would really love to see you there. And my last announcement is this. I didn't get to preach last Sunday, so I'm preaching my announcements and the sermon. Mm. 
Remember, October 29th, we're changing our second service time, so it'll be 9.30 and 11 a.m. No more 11.30 or a.m., it'll be 11 a.m. Hey, but let's go ahead and jump into the into the word this morning. We are finishing our uh, a collection of talks entitled, God, are you there? This is part three, and if you're taking notes today and you need a title, the title of this message is Breaking the Silence, Breaking the the silence. Next week we begin a brand new collection of talks which I'm extremely excited about and you'll be hearing more about that. But we're going to look at the life of Moses. If you don't know who Moses is, he's a character in the Old Testament. We're going to read in the book of Exodus chapter 3 verses 1 through 15. Many of you are familiar with this text, but don't allow your familiarity to breed contempt in what the Holy Spirit wants to speak to your life. Often times, the longer we are in the church, when we come and we hear a text, we automatically say, we know where he's going, we know where she's going, and we tune out. Do not tune this out, because the Word of God is, will reap a harvest in your life if you allow it. So let's read verse 1. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the far side of the wilderness, and he came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within the bush. Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn. So Moses thought, I will go over there and see this strange sight, why the bush does not burn up. When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, here I am. He said, do not come any closer, God said. He said, take off your sandals, for the place that you are standing is holy ground. Then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. At this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. The Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I am concerned about their suffering. Verse 8, so I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up to the land into a good and spacious land. A land flowing with milk and honey. The home of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. And now the cry of the Israelites, good grief, that's a lot of rhyming, have reached me and I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. Verse 10, so now go, I'm sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? And God said, listen, I'm going to be with you. And this will be a sign to you that it is I who have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on the mountain. Verse 13, I'm almost done. Moses said to God, suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they asked me, what is his name? Then what shall I say? What shall I tell them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, say to the Israelites, The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. Let's pray. Lord, we come before you this morning once again. We thank you so much for what you're doing in this room and in this space. Father, I pray that for the next few minutes that I would decrease and that you would increase and that the very words that are being spoken in heaven this morning would be spoken here in this room and in this atmosphere. Lord, I ask that wherever we are at on this journey of our spirituality or of life, Whether we know you, whether we don't know you, whether we're skeptic, whatever it is, for the next few minutes, let's just put everything aside, any distraction, so that we might be able to hear you and see you more clearly. That you would speak to us and give us a word in this season, for this season, that would lead us into the next season, Lord. And Father, we thank you next door for our children. We thank you for all of our children's workers. We just pray a blessing over them and our children's pastors, Lord. And God, we just pray that today that the kids would just... uh, continue to learn about the love that you have for them and um, they will continue to learn more about you Lord, we love you and thank you and it's in jesus name we pray and everybody said amen and amen let's give it up for i real ladies and gentlemen flew in all the way from italy today just to play background keys for me which i am excited about you know when we first started this series um our collection of talks i think i was talking about the difference between hearing and listening, right? The hearing and listening are two different things. And as a father, I have become a Jedi master about listening and hearing and determining which one I need to do with my children. My house is only has one volume when you walk in. It is loud. 
There is constantly things going on in my house. I have four children, for those of you who don't know. Four and no more, bless God, amen, right? My house is, there's always a kid running this way, a kid running that way, a kid running out the door. I close it, lock it, turn off the lights, amen? But my house is always crazy. A ride in the van with four kids is even more insane because the kids are always talking, they're yelling, they're laughing, or they're fighting. Now, they spend more time doing the latter, which is fighting. So there is constant noise in my house. But as a father, I have this incredible gift That I have received from the heavenly host, from the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, this gift to be able to just tune them out. Like I can't, like you all ever see like Charlie Brown back in the day? Let me take you back. Like when they would talk, it was like wah 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 wah. Remember that? Anybody? Three people. Thank you. You just aged yourself, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. But I have this ability that I can just hear a wah, 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 wah. Like, I'm not paying attention to them and what's going on. I only listen for screams. I only look for blood, and that's it, guys. If we don't have any of those, we're good. The fam is good. But now I have three girls and a boy, and being a father of three girls is very challenging. I never thought about buying uh, guns until now. And so, um, never thought about it till now. And so... I've got three girls, and they talk a lot. There's always a lot of laughing going on and things of that nature. I tune them out. But there is particular trigger words that if I hear, these big old ears get a little bit bigger, and I tune in to be able to hear what is going on. You know, some of you guys have trigger words in your life. You hear certain things, and you're like, oh, my gosh, you call your therapist, right? So I have the same thing. I have the same thing. There are trigger words, trigger phrases, trigger things. And the trigger word or the trigger phrase is any time I hear the word boy, boyfriend, marriage, and husband. Those are the only words I care to hear about. Anything else Ashley can deal with. No, I'm just kidding. But let me tell you, when my girls start talking about boys or they start, now they're not allowed to date until they're 52, but when they start Talking about those things, man, I tune in. I could be in the bathroom with the door closed and the fan on and flushing and hear the word and I just run out. And I'm like, what'd you say? Because my ear is attentive to those things. That is when I begin to pay attention and I begin to lean in and I begin to listen to what it is that they have to say so that I can send them to their rooms for the rest of their lives and they can be single. Amen. Thank you, guys. God bless you. We'll see you next week. Thank you. It's good. (laughs) Don't forget to give. Listen, (laughs) if you're new today, I am this crazy. I am sorry. I I no longer apologize for it. I just just go with it. Uh, (laughs) Oh, my God. Thank you. Oh, my God. Thank you. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. (laughs) This is awesome. (laughs) But it gets my attention. And in the same way, Moses has gone his entire life. And he has yet to hear the voice of God. He has gone on living for several years and through several seasons and through several difficult moments and ups and downs. And he has never listened or heard the voice of God until this moment when God gets his attention in such a way that Moses has no other option. He has no other choice but to pause for the moment and lean in to see who is it that is speaking through that bush. God catches his attention, not with a trigger word, but with a burning bush out of all things that would attract Moses' attention. We said that God speaks to you uniquely as he has fashioned you. He knows how to get your attention and he knows how to speak to you in such a certain way that would cause you to lean in. And for some reason, this was the way and the method that God chose, that he would light a bush on fire and let it burn. Amen. I'm not going to sing the song, although it came to my mind. But for the first time, Moses is hearing the voice of God, and he leans in, and he begins to listen. Because I think at the very end of the day that Moses was in such a place of brokenness. He was a place in his life where I don't think he thought that he would be, or he did not want to be. He thought that he would be somewhere else, but he's in this place. And in this place of brokenness, in this place of desolation, he is desperate to hear the voice of God. Sometimes God will go silent and allow you to get to a place of desperation and brokenness so that you can finally tune your ear to heaven and hear what he's been trying to tell you the entire time. You just closed him off. And so he's in this position to listen. Why would you say he's in a position to listen? I want you to look at the three parts of Moses' life. Moses spent the first 40 years of his life in Pharaoh's courts trying to be a somebody. 
He spent the second 40 years of his life in the desert as a nobody. And he spent the last 40 years of his life leading God's people as God's somebody, fulfilling his purpose. So you have to understand that Moses spent 80 years as a nobody and God would break the silence where Moses would finally tune himself in to be able to, to hear. My first thought is this, one of our greatest desires is to hear the voice of God. We talked about this in the beginning. We all have this desire that we want to be seen. We want to be known. We want to know that we have worth and value. We want to be heard, but at the same time, we want to be heard by the one who sees us, by the one who gives us our worth, by the one who gives us our value, by the one that gives us life and the one that gives us purpose. We all want to hear God. We would be lying, even for people who do not believe in God. They probably have set this thing up that, God, if you speak to me, then I know that you are real and I will worship you. I think at the end of the day, we all want God to speak to us. Some of you right now, you've been in a place and in a season where God has been quiet. And I, and I know this, you can go into the word of God and you can listen to his word through his logos. But there are times when God speaks to you intimately with a whisper. He speaks to us in certain ways. And maybe you're in a season right now where you feel like God has gone silent. You feel like God has been quiet. You've been asking God, you've been petitioning God, you've been coming to the throne room of grace, you've been on your knees, you've been begging, you've been praying, God speak for your servant is listening and God has yet to respond to you. Well, if you're not there and you get there, it will happen, but how do we respond in those moments? Let me tell you something, it is so hard when God goes silent. It is so hard when you are asking God to give you an answer and you feel like there is no answer that is coming. You feel like heaven has closed up shop, like they moved their things on and they went to Fresno to go set the fair up there. God, I'm still triggered by the fair. Sorry, ladies and gentlemen. It's so hard when God goes silent. I think that one of the most frustrating moments in my spiritual journey is always when I feel that God goes silent. When the God isn't speaking. I think that the most time in my life that I become most introspective in my spirituality is when God ceases to speak. It causes me to take so much inventory in my life. And the question would be, well, why did it take God so long to speak to Moses? Why did it take 80 years for God to appear to Moses in the form of a burning bush and begin to speak from that? Now, Scripture is not clear on why that happened, but maybe God had made attempts to speak to Moses before, but Moses was never in a place of desperation and brokenness such as this to be able to hear from God. Sometimes it's not that God has gone silent, right? It's that, that there's so much noise and so much chaos and sometimes so much pride in our lives that even if he speaks, we wouldn't posture ourselves to listen because we've already made up our mind in the direction that we're going and what we're going to do. Maybe God knew that, hey, I would waste my breath if I spoke to Moses before those 80 years. If I spoke to him, he wouldn't listen anyway. So what's the point of wasting my time? Scripture isn't clear and we don't know, but I do know this. It's usually in the deepest and the darkest valleys that we become the most open to the voice of God. And then when he speaks, we struggle sometimes. We struggle to discern his voice. We struggle to know, God, is this you speaking? We, we kind of ask ourselves three questions. God, is that me? God, is that those around me? Or God, is that you that is speaking? I don't know about you, but I just know when the voice of God speaks, he speaks so clearly. It comes with so much truth. It could be a whisper, but yet sounds so loud and resonates so much with our spirits. Which brings me to my second thought, which is this, and I foreshadowed that. That there are seasons in where the loudest thing in your life is the silence of God's voice. There will be seasons that you go through of God's silence and his silence will echo the loudest in your soul and in your life. I married a spicy Latina and she's not in first service. She will be in second service because she's Latina. So we're late to every. No, I'm just kidding. Nonetheless, nonetheless. I'm Latino myself. And, you know, one of the things that people always think about Latinas is that they're loud and they fight and they're aggressive. And I'm here to say that's all accurate. Absolutely true. 100% true. 100% true. I would be naive and lying to you if I told you that my wife and I never had conflict, if we never had tension, if we never argued. We do. We do. Just like any other couple, we have our moments. And 95% of the time, 
She's right, but don't tell her I said that. Don't use this one for YouTube. Use second service video for YouTube, okay? Now, I'm not afraid of Ashley, or I'm not as concerned when she's loud and boisterous because I just expect that from her. What concerns me, and men, you know about this, is when she goes silent. There's nothing worse than the silent treatment, fellas. There's nothing worse. I'd rather take a wife that is yelling than a wife that goes quiet. Walk by the house, you walk by the room, uh, hi honey, are you okay? Mm-hmm. Honey, do you need anything? Mm-mm. And then when you send a text and it stays on red and all you get is the letter K, woo, you done messed up. You done messed up, boy. Call your friend because you're spending the night. Amen. The silence scares me. It always causes me to reflect on my life, on the purpose and the meaning of life and determine why, what did I do, God? What did I do? There are moments, there are seasons that God goes silent. That God just ceases to speak in the way that he's been used to speaking. He stops feeding you in the way that you're accustomed to be fed. And I feel like, I said this before, but I feel like that's so hard. What do you do when God goes silent in your life? Maybe you're in a place right now where you've been seeking the face of God seeking first his kingdom and his righteousness, and yet you just feel like he's so far, like he's so distant. There's something about the silence that causes you to question the validity of God's at attentiveness in your life. It causes you to question, am I doing the right thing? It causes you to question your motives. It causes you to question the steps of your life that you thought were ordained by him. It causes you to question the things that you stepped out in faith to do. It causes you to question the season. It causes you to question everything in the moment of silence. And yet he chooses to go silent. And all throughout scripture, and all throughout biblical history, we see that God has gone silent on people. Ecclesiastes 3, 1 and 7 says, for everything there is a season, a time for every activity under heaven, a time to be quiet, and a time to speak. Even Job, throughout the book of Job, experienced God's silence. Listen to this. But if he remains silent, who can condemn him? If he finds his face, who can see him? Yet he is over individual and nation alike. Even David, throughout the Psalms, speaks of God's silence. The last book in the Old Testament is Malachi. The first book in the New Testament is Matthew. You know that between Malachi and Matthew, there is 400 years of absolute silence from heaven. God did not speak. There was not a prophet until John the Baptist came into the wilderness and was leading people to be baptized and repent of their sin. From Malachi to John, silence. And scripture isn't clear why. Scripture doesn't tell us why. It was just God going silent in that moment. So why does God go silent? God, why do you do that? He hasn't answered me, so until next week, guys. You know, there's several reasons that I think he goes silent. Sometimes it's our sin. Nothing can separate you from the love of God. Neither height nor depth, nor angel nor demon. None of that can separate you from the love of God. But your sin can separate you from the presence of God. Yes, he lives in me, and at the same time, he also lives around me. But there is this, this way that our sin can detach us from his presence. Not from his love, but from his presence. So sometimes God goes silent because there's a sin issue in our lives. Sometimes he goes silent on you because he's still waiting for you to walk in obedience to the last thing he asked you to walk in obedience that you have yet to listen to him. So why waste his breath on telling you a next step in your life when you haven't done something with the first step? Sometimes that's why he goes silent. Sometimes he goes silent because he's testing you. They say a teacher is always quietest during the test. Sometimes his silence is a test to see what you do, what you'll do and what you won't do. You know that sometimes God goes silent because I think he's trying to wean us off of an emotional spirituality. He's trying to get us to draw closer to him. The word declares, if you draw close to me, then I'll draw close to you. Sometimes he goes silent so that he can wean us off this. We only need to feel the goose pimples. We only need to feel all the, 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 all the fuzzies to know that God is with us. And so he, 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 he goes silent in order to get us to wean off of that emotional spirituality and lead us in truth. Could you still worship him without the goose pimples? Could you still lean on him and love on him in, in those difficult moments? 
Sometimes he goes silent because he's setting the stage in your life. You know, I went to the Hollywood Bowl a couple of weeks ago to go see this artist named Maxwell. And when you walk into the place, there's music playing, and it's awesome, and it's great. And the DJ's playing all sorts of throwbacks and stuff, and I just really felt old, but it was awesome. And <laughs> there was no young per- I was the youngest person there. And anyways, um, but right before Maxwell gets ready to go on stage, dead silence. The music stops. Everything stops. The lights go out. The crowd is quiet. For a few seconds, and then all of a sudden, bam, it hits. He goes on stage, and the performance begins. Sometimes God goes silent because he's setting the stage to give you the breakthrough on the other side that you've been praying about. He's setting the stage in your life to bring the blessing that you've been desiring. He's setting the stage in your life to take you to the next season of your life. 1 Corinthians 2.9 says this. No eye has seen and no ear has heard and no mind has imagined what God has prepared for those who love him. And lastly, maybe sometimes God goes silent. We just don't know why. We just don't know why. The Bible says that his ways are not our ways, that his thoughts are not our thoughts. And so if he chooses to go silent without a reasoning, that's on him. But one of the things that I think about silence is that the silence of God reveals who you are in your heart. It has the ability to reveal who you really are. It has the ability to reveal the motives in your heart. When you look at the life of Moses, you see that his heart was revealed in the absence of hearing God's voice. Have you ever gone to text someone and they didn't text you back? They left you on red for like a month? Have you ever texted Matt Mutchler and he never gets back to you? You know, the other day I had texted, I'll use Matt because this is my illustration. I was texting Matthew Mutchler, and um, I'd been texting him and texting him, and he hadn't responded. It had been like almost eight hours, and I finally sent him this text back saying, I don't appreciate you ghosting me, dog. Dog. And like an hour later, he texts me back, and he said, hey, I'm so sorry that I didn't text you, man. My phone broke. I've been at Verizon all day trying to get a phone. So where'd you go to Verizon? In Maine? Nonetheless. Nonetheless. In the moment of my speaking and texting and his silence, I began to assume all kinds of things. How many of you haven't received a text back from someone and you make assumptions? Some of you who are dating, you test your significant other. Even though he put a ring on it, you didn't hear back from him in three hours. You already called the marriage off. You called 911. You returned the dress. It is over. Psycho, right? But like, all these assumptions. Oh, they ain't my friend anymore. Like, you text your friend. They don't like me anymore. They're too busy for me. We make, oh, it begins to reveal what's really in our heart. It's the same thing with God. When he goes silent, I think what's really in our heart begins to be revealed in that moment. And the decisions we make and the things that we think about and the actions that we take. We often think that God's silence is him abandoning us or him calling us to a different direction or to do something different. Maybe his silence is him just saying, keep going and doing what you're doing and continue to walk in the marching orders that I already gave you. And when things need to change, I'll speak to you in a new way. Don't allow the silence to throw you off the course. Don't allow the silence to throw you off the goal to win the prize. Don't allow the silence to throw your walk off, your relationships off. Maybe his silence is him testing you, him setting the stage for you, or him just trying to draw you closer to you. Maybe his silence is him saying, you're doing great, keep going, and when things need to change, I'll let you know. We struggle to be in the silence. What happens is in those silent seasons and moments, what do we do? We take things into our own hands and we make things happen on our own. I gave you those three seasons of Moses' life to kind of bring us to this place. You know, Moses didn't hear God until 80 years later. But Moses knew that he was called to greatness. He knew that he was called to something. He just didn't know God's timetable. 
He knew that he was called to deliver God's people from a young man. He had had this desire growing up in Pharaoh's courts to liberate the Israelites from the Egyptians. He didn't know how and he didn't know when. He just knew he needed to do it. And so what happens is, is that Moses, in the midst of God's silence, takes a step prematurely and throws things off. Maybe it was God's original plan. We'll never know. But in God's silence, instead of continuing to walk in obedience, he decides to sidestep and make things happen on his own. That's what gets you in trouble. When God is silent and you try to make things happen on your own, we end up making a mess of things. Just like that text, you begin to assume things, you begin to judge, you begin to think all kinds of things, and then your thoughts lead you to your actions, and your actions dictate the course of your life. Has anybody in this room ever messed anything up because of silence? I've almost made the dumbest decisions, and I have made the dumbest decisions in the middle of a season of God's silence. Well, if you're not going to speak to me, then I'm going to speak to myself, and I'm going to do what I need to do to make things happen. Sometimes that's the test. I needed to show you that you didn't really trust me because of what was in your heart and what you just declared with your words and what you just did with those thoughts that turned into actions right there son right there daughter that shows me that you didn't trust your father you didn't trust me for provision you didn't trust me for the business you didn't trust me for the relationship you didn't trust me for the blessing you did not trust me and i had to show you where your faith really is The silence is often the testing ground. See, Moses, when he was younger, saw an Egyptian, uh, an Egyptian guard uh, messing with an, Isra an Israelite, and Moses took it into his own hands. He killed the Egyptian. He buried him in the sand. The next day he goes out, he sees two Egyptians duking it out, and Moses tries to stop it. And they say, are you going to do the same thing to us as you did to that Egyptian guard? And he freaked out, and he ran, and Pharaoh tried to kill him, so he fleed. So in his heart heart was the right motives, but in the season, it wasn't the right time. But he took it into his own hands. See, when was the right time when God said, when God spoke? Some of you are on the precipice of making a stupid decision right now because God did not say, but your own will and intuition did. So you have to be careful that in the silence, you don't make these premature decisions. See, I knew that I was called to ministry. I knew that I was called to do great. I knew that I was called to pastor, but you know what my mistake was? That I stepped out too soon. I tried to make my own way, but I didn't have the character to sustain the weight of the blessing in the silence of God's season. So I made things happen on my own until it crushed me like it crushed Moses. Be careful about your next move if God hasn't ordained it. If God hasn't said it, don't say, God, I want your will to be done on earth as it is in heaven, but yet you want to navigate your own life and do things your own way. What if we were people that were more attentive and, and tuned in to the voice of God, tuned in to the scriptures of God? And if God hasn't spoke, then I'm going to stand still. I'm going to be faithful in what he's called me to until he gives me the marching orders for the next. Your consistency will be tested in his silence. Your consistency will be tested in his silence. Can I be consistent in the silence? Or does that mean I have to pivot? Some of you are great at starting. You suck at finishing. You never finish anything, and not because it's your spiritual gifting. You just start things, and this is good, and then it, the, the high fades away, and then, and then you move on to the next thing. And I'm not telling you you have this apostolic calling in your life. It's just that you're always, you, you're always jumping to the next, to the next, to the next. And God is saying, maybe in my silence you just need to be sustained in my love, and in my presence. Are you still with me this morning? Number three is this. Once God speaks, though, we have two options. Don't ask God to speak if you're not ready to respond. Your two options are this, to obey or disobey. Am I going to do what God said, or am I not going to do what God said? Listen to James 1.22. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Just do what it says. It says, don't be deceived. Don't deceive yourselves. We always think the devil deceived me. No, you deceived yourself. Sometimes it's the devil. Sometimes it's kukui. Sometimes it's the chupacabra. But sometimes it's us. How do we deceive ourselves? When we try to manipulate the word and the call that God has given us to obedience to fit our own agenda. Some of you, God has spoken, but you haven't liked what he said, so you've manipulated it. You manipulate it to fit your agenda. 
my wife said something to me the other day. It was like gut wrenching. She was she was right. So the, the decision that had to be made, and um, I get excited. And and Ashley Ashley's like the voice of reason. She's the voice of truth. It's just you know my gifting is to be out front. I think it's very apostolic. It's like hey, let's go on a new territory, new every in everything of my life. Let's try a new restaurant. Like let's do this, right? Let's do all of that. And I was trying to assure some Ashley of something, and she says to me, "Honey, stop." And at that moment, I began to cry because I knew what was next. <laughs> she said, you could sell water to a well. It's not about that. It's about what God says. And I said, your mom. Your mom. You got that from your mom, right? But, but she was trying to say, sometimes your passion can lead you to think you've heard from God. And you can lead others to think that you heard from God, but you have to be careful because did God say? That's the fear that I have to walk in. That's the constant conviction I need to walk in. Is this what you said, God, or in your silence, am I making a decision that I shouldn't be making? But I think that God was giving Moses an opportunity and worship team or somebody of y'all want to come up as I wrap this up. God was giving Moses for the first time the opportunity to become someone and have purpose. And all he did was ask Moses to do one thing, to obey. To obey. Moses, God hasn't spoken to you. You haven't heard him in 80 years of your existence. God speaks to you and he calls you to do what was always in you. The thing that you knew what was in you, the dream that you had, the desire that you had, he is calling it out because now is the time to walk in truth and in obedience to who I've designed you to be. And what does Moses do? He gives God a pocket full of excuses as to why he can't do it. Deceiving himself. You got to be careful when you ask God to speak. Because you're not always going to like what he has to say. You got to be careful when you ask God to give you a response. Because he'll give you a response. So when you have that, when you get that response, you have a responsibility, obey or disobey, to do or not to do, to be or not to be. That is the question. And you might not always like what he's calling you to do. You might not always like the direction he's leading you through. You might not always like his response. So you got to be careful. <laughs> Maybe some of you want to sit in the silence a little bit longer. The crazy thing to me, though, is that this is what Moses knew he was created to do. And he was willing to give God excuses. I think that some of us in this room, you've been giving God excuses. You've been giving God excuses to something he's asked you to do. He's been calling you to a sense of obedience, but you have a list of excuses of why you can't do what he's asked you to do. Sometimes I think maybe God already knows that you're going to give him excuses so he continues to remain silent until he sees your heart is ready to be able to handle what he's going to share with you. This Christian life is it's really about obedience or, not, or no obedience. Partial obedience is no obedience at all. What has God been calling you to today? Has God been speaking to you? Has God, out of the silence, finally appeared to you and spoken to you and called you to something? I always say this too. So many people will go to the grave with unsung songs because we never step out in faith and in obedience to what he calls us to. And maybe if God is silent in this season in your life, maybe he hasn't spoken to you in the way that you're accustomed to him speaking to you, I would challenge you when he speaks, he's going to put something before you that you're going to have two options. To obey or to disobey. There's no point in asking God to speak if you have no intentions to, follow, to respond to what he's speaking to you about. And lastly, obedience is the better choice. See, obedience opens up the door to fulfillment. 
1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 22 says, But Samuel replied, Does the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much as in obeying the Lord? He says, To obey is better than sacrifice, and to heed is better than the fat of rams. His obedience is better than sacrifice, but sometimes the obedience is the sacrifice. Maybe sometimes that's why God stays silent. Because he knows what he's going to call you to is going to require you to sacrifice something, to give something up in order to step into the next. To lay something aside in order to move into your next. I truly believe, I say this prophetically in a sense, I really believe that many of you are in a transition of seasons. We've been in a transition of physical seasons here, and I always believe that when there's a transition of physical seasons in the natural realm, it's indicative of the fact that there's a transition in the spiritual realm for seasons. We've gone out of summer, and now we're transitioning to summer part two here in Bakersfield, right? We've transitioned into fall, and some of us struggle to actually not realize that we've trans. Many people don't know it's fall. You don't know it's fall because we still have glimpse of, pre of things from the previous season that have jumped over into this season, but that's not indicative of the fact that the season hasn't changed. That's just indicative of the fact that this season is still trying to hold on to last season. I don't know if you caught that, but some of you, I think that God is trying to transition you into a new season but he's, you're struggling to transition into the new season because you're still holding on to things from the last season and you're trying to walk in the newness of this season. And God is saying, until you let go of that thing, you can't step into the new thing in this season of what I have for you. Come on, if that's for you, I want you to give God praise. Stand to your feet, stand to your feet, stand to your feet. I want you to bow your head and close your eyes for just a moment. I'm done. But maybe there is something in your heart that you know God has been speaking to you to finish this, to do that, to let go of this, to let go of that mindset, to let go of this sin, to do whatever it is. And he's speaking, but he stopped speaking and he stopped speaking because he knows that you haven't done anything with what he already told you. Whatever that is right now is between you and the Lord. And maybe right now is the moment to release that, to relinquish it and say, God, I'm going to walk in obedience today. I'm going to choose to step into everything that you have for me. Or God, when you speak, I'm going to make the decision to walk in obedience and in truth to what you have for me. If you don't know Jesus this morning, and you want to come into a relationship with him, the Bible says the only way to the Father is through the Son, being Jesus, the one who died on the cross and rose on the third day for our sins. You don't have to do anything else to be saved except just believe in your heart and confess with your mouth. If you need Jesus today for the first time, or you need Jesus because it's been a long time, maybe you've really fallen away from Jesus, and you want to realign your life with him. With every head bowed and every eye closed, all you need to do is say, Jesus, I believe you died on the cross. I believe that you rose on the third day. Jesus, come into my heart. Jesus, come into my life. Jesus, forgive me of my sins. Jesus, I'm coming back to you. Jesus, I give you my life from this moment on. Jesus, I don't know everything from Genesis to Revelation. I don't understand all of this church stuff, but Jesus, what I do understand is that I want you in my life. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, everybody said, Give a round of applause to all those who prayed that prayer. Thank you for joining us for this week's message. We hope that you are encouraged and inspired by what God is doing in your life. So we want to remind you that you can give to our ministry by visiting our website. And hey, we would love to have you join us in person. We have two service times at 9.30 a.m. and 11.15 a.m. And we would love to see you there. See you next week.